When the rain comes down on me When I look to heaven, clouds are all I see I think back to the saints of God Who really walk with the Lord They remind me when times get bad It's in God I'll be restored they tell me, pray, brother, pray, pray, brother, pray, give praise to the Lord with adoration, and pray, brother, pray, pray, don't give up, pray, draw near to the Lord of our salvation. The gates of heaven seem so far away. I've been listening too much to what the world has to say. I feel my flesh rushing up in me. It wants to take control. I found there's only one medicine to restore my
Good morning. Welcome to Crossover Church of God, and happy Father's Day to all of you who, to whom that applies. Amen. Amen. We honor you. We're glad that you're here, and we hope that you know how much you are honored and loved by your Father. And we're going to be singing of our wonderful Father today. We just encourage you to join in in worship. Let's open up our hearts to him. He is a good, good Father who loves each and every one of us unconditionally and perfectly. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for fatherhood. We thank you that it originates from you, our Father, who is in heaven. Yes, amen. Hallowed is your name. Father, we thank you that as we gather together today, in the name of Jesus, that you are right here with us. Lord, may we open up our hearts to you and draw near to you, Lord, with clean hands and a pure heart and offer up our praise and our thanksgiving to you today. And we thank you for dwelling here among us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's worship. Let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great things Every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. You have done great things, God. You do great things. You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great things Hallelujah God Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Well, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Oh, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us 
every spiritual blessing in the kingdom of heaven. Help us, Father God, to start grasping the great and magnificent inheritance that you have given us and grasping the power that you have given us through the Holy Spirit to walk out the day. We're praying for revival, not to change the nation, not to change how we see things in the world, but for the kingdom of God, for that great inheritance for after this life, forever and ever. So, Father God, open up the heavens. Let the Spirit fall upon this place in a way that has never been seen before. Let your Holy Spirit blow your power throughout us into this world, into this city, into the community, to each other, into our own families. Help us to rule our kingdom area with kingdom values, with your values. Because when we get our eyes on you and off the world, we bring glory to the kingdom, and that is what it's all about. It's not about today surviving in this flesh. It is about our entire future, and it's not just ours, but it's every last person breathing on this planet. Let us get that through our heads, and let us live that way like the Bible is true and is true, and have us believe it with everything we got in the name of Jesus. Fortress, you go before us. 
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of God. Let's declare it again. Almighty fortress. Almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. At this time, we're going to receive our tithe and our offering as we continue to worship. I've heard a thousand stories of what Perfect 
perfecto all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you're a good, good Father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 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 for your goodness this morning. We thank you for your great love and your great compassion. Father, we just lift up to you today all who are sick, Lord God. There are many throughout our congregation and our families who are sick today, God, and we just plead the blood of Jesus over them. Father, we pray for your healing virtue to be released in the powerful name of Jesus over their lives and we thank you and we give you praise that you are here with us, meeting us here today, bringing healing to us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Mike. <laughs> Good morning, church, all of you out there watching. Um, as is customary here at Crossover Church, every year we like to kind of celebrate Father's Day by giving some really neat little envelopes <laughs> to some of you. Um, but before I, before I do that, um, let me share my heart. 
Father's Day. Father's Day. You know, I woke up this morning, I'm thinking, Father's Day, I'm a father. But I also realize for some of you out there, that's a bittersweet day, right? Some of us that grew up without fathers, one in four, at least 25%, we wonder what's going on with our society. Not to bring condemnation, but it's, it's reality. So, you know, I wake up father. Father's Day, you know, my dad left when I was five. Left my mom with three kids, in diapers, two kids. And, and now that I'm a father, my kids are grown, um, there's a lot of meaning behind being a father, you know. Um, and a lot of us didn't have that father figure. And so I just, I, want, I just want to say to, to you dads out there uh, that are doing their best, that maybe didn't have a father, Jesus sees you. He sees you. Those young boys out there without a father, I coached for years, and I always purposely picked out the kids that I knew their dads weren't around. Breaks my heart. Jesus sees you guys. Jesus sees you young boys, okay? He sees you. And so with Father's Day, um, it's deep. And for some of us, it hurts. But at the end of the day, me being a father, we're going to do the best we can. We're not perfect. Even though the good Lord laid out what it is to be a father in his book, hey, let's face it, many of us fell short. And I don't think Jesus wants us to wake up every morning guilt-ridden over it. You know what I mean? Uh, we can beat ourselves up, guys. And there's a lot of pressure on men. You know, being the breadwinner, you know, being the guy that, uh, you know, has the world on his shoulders, and it's not easy, and it's getting tougher and tougher, I think, every day. So um, I just want to lift you guys up that are still in the fight, walking forward and being the best father and grandparent now that you can. So Father's Day, uh, to me, although it can be bittersweet, um, I think we all need to lift each other up, man, you know, and continue to encourage each other to keep walking the walk. We're not perfect. We may have made some mistakes, but those of you that are still in it, grinding it out, being great dads and, and trying to be great grandparents, kudos to you. Jesus sees you. Okay. okay, now for the good stuff. All dads, can I have you please stand up? Well, we're going to embarrass you guys right off the get-go here. <laughs> so our first, uh, our first little prize, if you will, is going to go to the father that's been the father the longest. So those of you standing up, if you have been a father 10 years or less, please sit down. Ooh, got some old guys in here. 20 years or less, please sit down. Wow. 25 years or left, please sit down. Holy cow, we're in the geriatrics here. <laughs> 30 years or less, please sit down. Okay, there's a few of them. 35 years or less. 40 years or less. Okay, I was wondering, Clayton. 45 years or less. Okay, wow. 50 years or less? Okay, we have four left standing, so I'm going to tread lightly here. Uh, <laughs> 55 years or less. We have a winner. Come on up. <laughs> you can come on up, please. Would you like to uh, tell everybody your name and how long you've been a father? My name is Charles Miller, and I've been a father for 71 years. Well, congratulations. You set the bar very high today. <laughs> Which 
Mm -hmm. right. oh. Okay, Texas Roadhouse it is. Well, congratulations. Now we're gonna do random drawing. Okay, now we're going to draw for the, we have three more left here. So this is just random drawing, gentlemen. Good luck to you. Pick oh, one. I get to pick. Okay. Watch him pick himself. <laughs> Big Steve, come on up. <laughs> I think that was rigged. <laughs> Whichever one you'd like. Oh, this is gonna be oh. taking the candy. It's going to go quick. <laughs> okay, number... I'll pick that one. Oh, okay. Vicky okay. picked this one. Don Burkett or Burkett? Don, come on up. <laughs> How many years have you been a father? 52. 52 years. That's a warrior. Okay. He's got some home repairs to do. Okay. And then our last victim. It just says Michael, so I'm going to assume Mike Line. Come on up. <laughs> and how many years, Mike, have you been a father? 44. 44 years. Okay. Hey, let's give a hand to all the dads. Hey. Thank you, Jim and Vicki. It's awesome. Good morning again. Have the honor and privilege today of bringing the word of God to you. Um, our pastor unexpectedly wasn't able to be here today, and um, so I get to fill in. And it's a privilege always to do that. I am so thankful for how God uh, spoke through you, Jim, because as I was preparing today, actually, I, I didn't remember it was Father's Day um, until about I don't know, beginning of the week, and Dee and I were talking, and she goes, oh, and by the way, um, I'll give out the gift cards when we get done with worship, and I'm like, gift cards? I'm like, is it Father's Day? And she's like, yes, isn't it? <laughs> so we checked the calendar, and I'm like, yes, it's Father's Day. So um, I normally can take longer than a week to prepare a sermon. Um, matter of fact, if I do it in a week, I'm doing really good. And so when I found out that I would be speaking today, I was like, oh, good. I just finished a class, um, the Introduction to Preaching and Teaching, um, that was offered through uh, Patton University. And I had just finished it. And of course, if you're taking a preaching class, you have to prepare sermons, right? So I had just completed my second assignment. And I'm like, oh, wow, good. I've got that sermon. It's camp meeting this week wonderful, right? And so, um, and I felt like it fit in good with the series that our pastor is in right now, which is a season of healing. And the sermon that I had prepared for my class was entitled, Take Action, The End is Near. And it was based on 1 Peter 4, 7 through 9. And, in, and I was like, wow, this fits in perfectly because our pastor has been challenging us to come out of our brokenness, to cut the head off of the voice of our brokenness and, and all the lies that have kept us underneath where God wants us to be, have kept us bound up. And it fits along perfectly with 1 Peter calling us to action because the end of time is near. And we always need a why, right? We need, we need a why. If we're going to take um, action for change, and especially something that has become so comfortable in our lives, our why needs to be bigger than our pain. So I felt like that that would fit in perfectly. However, when I sat down on Friday and I was beginning to go over the notes, beginning to go over the sermon, and, 
and looking at um, what God would have me to, how he would have me to expand it. Because for our class, it only had to be 10 to 12 minutes. And you're going, yes, that's my kind of sermon, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, and I also was praying about Father's Day. And I was, Lord, how do you want to bring in Father's Day into this message? Because I've had the privilege of speaking on Father's Day here before. And so when I have, it's always been a message tailored to Father's Day. So I was, I was praying about that. And, and God... Um, Help me to see how you want to bring in fathers. And as I began to pray about that and began to think about the sermon that I had prepared, God began to drop a message into my heart. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> wow. Really, God? <laughs> That's what you want me to speak on today? <laughs> um, it's a challenging one. Maybe it won't be challenging for you. It was challenging for me, very challenging. Matter of fact, this particular topic, um, if you've been coming here for a while and you've heard me speak and you've heard me share parts of my testimony throughout the messages, um, you will know that God took me on a journey um, that lasted about five years. And that was a, a journey of healing, a journey of getting down to the very core, those core beliefs that our pastor has been talking about, that what we believe to be true about ourselves at the core of who we are determines our behavior, right? And it, it determines really how we can um, operate in faith, because if we are believing something at the core of our being that goes against what we know in our head to be true, from the word of God, then there's that etern internal conflict. So during that um, journey that God took me on, he began to address some things that are at the core of my very being. And one of those had to do with um, forgiving and loving, opening up my heart to love and having intimacy even in the husband, that's my husband over here, for those of you who may not know, um, even having intimacy in the marriage relationship um, with an openness. When we're talking about intimacy, it's more than just sexual intimacy. That's just one small part of it. Intimacy is the ability to be honest, to, be, to have honest communication, to actually let someone see inside of us, to trust them with that, to be vulnerable. And that was the part of intimacy that was lacking in my life. So God started that journey by challenging me in that area. As you know, today, as, as Jim was sharing his heart about Father's Day, that in our culture today, fatherhood is under attack like never before. In our culture today, not only is fatherhood under attack, masculinity is under attack. One of the things that came out of this two-year period of time that we've been in with COVID and all of the other things that began to come to the surface in our nation, one of the things that came to the surface was colleges actually offering classes to men, college students, that they could take classes to unlearn their masculinity, that their masculinity was evil, their masculinity was wrong. They needed to learn how to reject their masculinity. And there were actually classes that young men were encouraged, strongly encouraged on some, strongly encouraged on some college campuses to participate in. As I was uh, preparing this message, I was reading a study that said that there has been a massive decline in the amount of men attending college today. And part of the reason why is because they're not wanted on campus, or that's what they feel like, that they are not wanted on campus. Because it is all about equalizing um, everything and lowering this whole patriarchal society, masculinity, um, of, of course, all the lines that are being blurred between our genders. Um, and this is a direct attack of Satan 
He has been attacking male and female from the garden, and it has only increased, and it has it is increasing in a rapid measure in our society, in our culture today. So I believe that Satan's attack um, on the role of men, particularly if he can get rid of gender, if he can get rid of masculinity, if he can get rid of the role of men in our society, then he can um, basically eliminate God in even a greater measure. Why? Because God is a symbol of authority. He is authority. He is authority. And our society since the 1960s particularly has been moving full speed ahead towards the rejection of all authority. So I believe that that is part of, obviously part of the enemy's plan. So as, as I've said, Pastor has had us um, in this series the last three weeks that he has spoken on the season of healing. God began to put upon my heart, and I know from my own experience, that one of the areas that we most need healing of is this understanding of the male and female, the understanding of the role that God has given to man and to woman, and for us as a church to embrace God's design rather than to be pulled into our culture and be desynthesized and become part of the culture that is around us to where we act no differently towards men. Our attitudes, our perspectives towards men is no different from that of the world, from someone who doesn't believe in Christ, who doesn't follow Christ. And that should not be the case. It is all around us. It is in every TV show, it's in every, I say every, but it's in a lot of our media, our TV programming, our movies, magazine articles, social media for sure. We see it all around us. And the thing is, is that if we don't know the truth, if we are ambiguous, if we're kind of like, I don't know about you, but this season with COVID and, and the, the whole racial division that has just been brought to the forefront in a, in a great measure, all of the different things that have been going on in our culture in a matter of a couple of years has caused ambiguity. It's like, I think I know the truth. I, I believe this to be true, but there is so much that is going on all around me. There is so much that I'm inundated with. Where do I take a stand? What can I stand firmly on? And we know that the only thing that we can stand firmly on is the truth of God's word. So if I am going to take a stand on what it means that God created male and female, if I'm going to take a stand on what it means to, for there to be godly masculinity and godly femininity, if I'm going to take a stand on that, then I need to know the truth of God's word, and I need to submit to that truth. And we, we think about it when we, when we look at the scriptures that if you've been around church for any amount of time, you've, you've heard scriptures that talk about the relationship between the husband and the wife, how the wife is to submit to the husband as unto Christ, how the, one, how the husband is to love the wife as Christ loves the church. We're familiar with that. You may not be as familiar with another passage of scripture that talks about how um, the, the husband is the head of the woman. We may not be as familiar with that one. But when we read these passages of Scripture, a lot of times we just discount them or set them aside, and we use this, um, we use this biblical interpretation model that is a true model, and it's a true principle, that we take that we, when we're studying Scripture, we look at Scripture in its context, 
the context of the chapter that we're reading, the context of the book that that particular passage of scripture is found in, and then the context of the scripture as whole. But we also look at historical context. We, at, we also look at cultural context. So a lot of times we will take passages of scripture that we're uncomfortable with, and I say we because I do the same thing. We will look at passages that we're uncomfortable with, and we will attribute it to, well, okay, culturally speaking, um, okay, I can see why Paul was writing that because of that culture at that time. This is what was going on. And so it applied to them. It doesn't necessarily apply to me. And that is true that there are some cultural things that we can definitely take a look at. And we can say, okay, in that culture, this was true, but it doesn't necessarily apply to me. But there is an underlying principle of truth that is true regardless of which culture you live in, regardless of which generation you're part of, regardless of how long mankind is on the earth, the truth of God's word will not change. And the true principles of God's word doesn't change regardless of how long man has been in existence, regardless of how progressive we become, regardless of what our culture dictates. There are things about God's word that are true and they will remain true. So, godly masculinity, the truth that God created man as head of the woman, is true. The cultural aspect of the passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 11, there's cultural aspects there that have to do with the covering. A woman isn't to pray without a covering over her head, a, a, a literal covering, like a veil. I don't have a veil on. But it also says that women aren't to have short hair. It doesn't say women aren't to have short hair. But what it says is that a woman's hair is her covering. A woman's hair is her glory. I don't have long hair. Okay, so, but the principle is, am I under a covering? Or do I have a hardened, rebellious heart against the covering that God has placed over me? Do I have rebellion in my heart against authority? Do I have resistance in my heart against submitting to authority? That is the principle that is true regardless of what culture you live in and regardless of how long mankind is on the earth. That is still a true principle. So, in order for us to be healed, whether we be male or whether we be female, in order for us to be whole, we will be healed as we submit ourselves unto God in his whole counsel of his word. The parts that make us uncomfortable the parts that bump up against our hurt, that bump up against our woundedness, and those parts that we can just readily rejoice in. Regardless of what it is, if we are going to be healed, if we are going to be whole, if we are going to see a restoration of the family unit, if we are going to see our men thrive like like our brother Jim was sharing today, if we're going to see men thrive, if we're going to see them succeed in a culture that is so anti-male, if we're going to see them become who God created them to be, then we need the truth in our hearts, and we need to be able to submit to that truth even when it's difficult. Even when it's difficult. For men to be healed, for them to be whole, for them to become all that God has created them to be, we as women need to respect and honor and value manhood. We need to really, truly come before the Lord and ask him, is there anything in my heart Is there anything in my thinking that devalues men? Is there anything in my heart 
that seeks for their dishonor rather than their honor. That is what God is asking of us as his women, as his daughters. And then he also says to the men, is there anything in your heart? Is there anything that causes you to devalue a woman? Is there anything in your heart that causes you to dishonor them or to show them disrespect? God is asking that of us because at the very core of who we are, our identity, our sexual identity has been under attack since the garden. Since the garden. But Jesus came to restore. He came to bring us back to his original design and purpose. And we as the body of Christ should be flourishing while the world around us is, is wandering like that song that we sang. I've heard many stories of who some think you are, who they think you are. Do you know that there is a, a, a church here in the area who their doctrine, their doctrine, not just a thought, not just an idea, but their doctrine is that God is a woman? Their very doctrine, I mean, they have brochures printed up. They go out to River Park. They hand out tracts. Their very doctrine is that God is a woman. They base it on one scripture in the Bible, I believe it's in Galatians, where Paul is writing, and he's writing about the difference between Hagar and Sarah, and he's showing the difference between the covenants, being under the law, not being under the law, and it says, but the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. And they take that scripture, and they base their doctrine on that, and say God is a woman, God is a mother, is a woman. So this is at the basic core of who we are, and I'm, I'm, all of us have been hurt, all of us have been wounded. Women at the hands of men, men at the hands of women, and we all have need of God to redeem us and to restore us and to heal us and to make us whole and to set us right in our thinking so that we can honor one another and so that we can submit unto one another, whether you're married, whether you're single. Even if you're single and you say, well, I'm not a mom, I'm not a wife. I'm just a single woman making my way in the world. But even in that, is there anything in your heart that devalues the family? Are you coming alongside and supporting and upholding the family unit and family values and marriage? The scripture says that the marriage bed is to be honored by all. It's to be honored by all in society, not just those who are married. So a lot of times, um, because we've been wounded, when we hear God calling us to honor, when we hear God calling us to forgive, when we hear God calling us to value, it's difficult because the very one who caused us pain is the very one that God is calling us to honor, In marriage, we would see that wives often are on one side of the fence saying that if my husband loved me as Christ loved the church, then I would submit to him. And the husbands are on the other side of the fence saying if my wife would submit to me as she submits unto Christ, then I would love her the way Christ loves her. The problem is when neither of us will yield to God's design, healing, will not occur. 
The divide between men and women needs to change with the body of Christ. It needs to begin with the body of Christ. If the family unit is going to be built up instead of torn down, if it's going to thrive instead of disintegrating, it is going to be the people of God who are going to turn this thing around. We have to come back to God's design for marriage. We have to come back to God's design for family. It is up to us to show the world what God intended when he created man and woman. So I know that this message can be hard for our flesh to hear. Outside of the church and even within the church, men who are not submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ have caused much hard harm to women, and as I have said, women have also caused much harm to men. In her book, Healing the Soul of a Woman, Joyce Meyer lays out the attack of Satan upon women. In our nation, women were not given the right to vote until August 18, 1920. There's always been the issue of equal pay and property rights. The lack of education of women around the world brings harm to them and their children. If all women had a primary education, 1.7 million children would be saved from stunted growth due to malnutrition. Gender side is also an issue. Demographers estimate that 126 million women are missing due to gender side. Every year, we lose 2 million baby girls to sex-selective abortion and infanticide. Violence and abuse against women, of course, is is an issue. It's estimated that 35% of women worldwide have experienced either physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner or sexual violation by a non-partner at some point in their lives. And, of course, we know all about human trafficking. Women and girls make up 98% of victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation. So even though these statistics are horrific and they're very true in our world, the purpose of this sermon, obviously, is not to point fingers, is not to bash men, is not, as Jim said, to bring condemnation upon anybody. I believe that it is a call from God for all of us to do some soul searching, for all of us to wake up to the truth of his word so that we can receive healing for our wounds and not have our hearts hardened by sin's deceitfulness. In the, in the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, Paul writes this. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, those who are outside of Christ. We are no longer to live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness." If men and women continue to think of the opposite sex the way the world does, our hearts will be hardened towards God and towards each other. We see from this passage of Scripture that when, we're, when our hearts are hardened, we have ignorance. And we are separated and cut off from the life of God. 
If we continue in this condition, we will give ourselves over to the desires of our flesh. But this is not how we are to live. The rest of chapter 4 through verse 9 of chapter 6, in that whole section, the Apostle Paul gives us instructions for Christian living, which include instructions for Christian households. As I was reading over that section of scripture, and this is, Ephesians is one of the books that I meditate on often. And as I was reading through this section of scripture, it, to me, it was like, this is Paul's Beatitudes. We have the Sermon on the Mount, right, where Jesus gave the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. To me, this is like the Apostle Paul's Beatitudes, because Jesus, when he was giving the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you have heard it said, but I say. You have heard it said it's wrong to commit adultery, but I say, if you look after someone with lust in your hearts, you've already committed adultery, right? So Jesus was showing the difference between an external religion following rules and regulations that says, okay, as long as I don't do this, I'm okay, and he was saying, no, I'm taking it deeper. I want you to see what's inside your heart. And here the Apostle Paul in this section of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, he's saying this is the old self that is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and this is the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is how you are to live. And so he gives us this list of ways that we are to live now according to the new self that we have received from God. And so as he continues, we're not going to read through that whole list, but we're going to focus on when he gets to chapter 5 because of this understanding of needing to submit to one another. He ends this whole list of ways that we should live according to our new self by saying this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's for everyone. Not just the marriage, not just the wife and to the husband, but for all of us. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So then he goes on to say... Um, so before I get there, though, so if ladies, if we are living like those who are outside of the body of Christ when it comes to how we view men and therefore how we treat men or what our attitudes are towards men, then God is calling us to put off the old self because it's being corrupted by its deceitful desires and put on the new. And I want to say that in between those two is be made new in the attitude of your minds. That's the healing process. God understands that we need healing. Like Jim was saying, men, men who have grown up without a father, they need healing. So it's not just like, oh, okay, snap in line. I'm going to put off this old self. I'm just going to cut it off. I'm going to put off this old way of looking at men, and I'm going to jump over here, and I'm going to put on the new. It's a new day. Unfortunately, that's what we've done in the body of Christ, right? That's why so many people have become frustrated in their relationship with God because they're told, stop doing this, start doing this, and we do that, but in between, there is no renewing of the mind. If we just simply stop doing something and start doing something, that is simply behavior modification, and it will not last it is not true change. This takes time. God isn't expecting us just overnight to have our attitudes be completely changed. But what he is asking us to do is to acknowledge, I'm off base. I have some wrong thinking. I have some wrong attitudes. I have some wrong behavior, and it needs to be put off, and I need to put on the new, and the way I'm going to be able to do that is by the renewing of my mind. 
being renewed in the attitude of my mind. So that's how it's going to happen. I remember um, John Bevere, we did several of his um, studies here back in the day. And I don't remember which study it was that we were doing, but he shared um, about when God brought him through the process of being delivered from pornography. And he said that when he began to see the woman that he was looking at in that pornographic image, when he began to see her as somebody else's daughter, it began to change. His attitude towards women began to change because he had a different perspective of how he viewed women. That's the kind of change that God is calling us to, and that's going to be different for each and every one of us. That's why it requires us to get into the presence of God with his word and to come before him and say, Father, Holy Spirit, help me to put off my old self that is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and help me to put on the new. So in Ephesians 4.17, he says, so I insist on it in the Lord to no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Futility means being void of useful aim or goal. To be devoid of truth and appropriateness. How we speak, what we do, is it appropriate? What we say and how we respond to one another as male and female, is it appropriate? Is it based on the truth of God's word? If not, then it's futile. We're still participating in the futility of our thinking. It also can mean perverseness or depravity. And we see that in Romans chapter 1, where God, is, God tells us that because mankind decided to worship the created things rather than the creator, he gave them over to a depraved mind, a futile mind. They became futile in their thinking. We don't want to be there. We are the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. So that's not how we are to live. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So these passages of Scripture that Paul is sharing with us in Ephesians and then also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he's teaching us. He is teaching us according to the truth that he learned from Christ. And he's teaching us from the example that we have in Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Paul writes, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of Christ Jesus or same attitude of mind that Christ Jesus had. So be made new in the attitude of your minds. What's the attitude of the mind that we're to have? The same attitude that Christ had. And what was that attitude? Going on reading in Philippians 2, it says, who being in very nature God. Jesus was God, being in very nature God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I'm going to stop there for a moment. Woman is made in the very nature of man, right? Male and female, same nature. Woman was brought out of man. And then now, men are born of woman. We share the same nature. We are equal. This is not about equality. This is not about superior, superiority and inferiority. 
This is about position. This is about authority. This is about responsibility. This is about accountability. This is about respect and honor. It is not about equality. Jesus was equal with God. He was of the very nature of God. And yet, he did not consider his equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he didn't say, I'm equal with God. I'm equal with Father God. I'm of the same nature of God. Why should I have to go to earth? Why should I have to take on flesh? Why should I have to submit myself to death on a cross? I'm equal with you, Father God. Why don't you go? Or send Holy Spirit. Right? But isn't that what we do? I'm equal. I'm equal with you. Why should I have to submit to you? Why should I have to yield my preference? Why should I have to honor you or value you above myself? Why should I have to lay down my life, as it were, for another? I'm equal. I have the same rights. But it's because God has established an order that is for the purpose and the benefit of all mankind and the purpose and benefit of all of his creation. And it is honoring unto the Lord. And as we submit unto his way and unto his headship, we are submitting unto him. Do you know that Jesus, even though he humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross, and it says that the Father God exalted him far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every name that can be named, that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and yet the time will come when he is going to take the kingdom that's been given to him by the Father, and he's going to return it back into the Father's hands. He isn't grasping and holding on and trying to use his equality with God to his own advantage. He understands the overall plan of God. He understood what was needed for the redemption of mankind. He understood what was needed for healing of the human race. And if we will grab a hold that what God is calling us to do in our relationships with one another is part of that healing, it's part of that redemptive process, that it's a bigger picture than just us, we will be able to have the same mindset as Christ. So in in closing, as we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, this verse gives us some insight as to why the wife is to submit to her husband. It says, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So do you see how we're all under headship? We're all under authority? Jesus is under the headship of the Father, and then man is under the headship of Christ, and then woman is under the headship of man. Again, this doesn't have to do with equality or one being superior over the other. It is is a role, it is a um, position of authority that God has given for the benefit of all. David Gussick, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 11.3, writes, In its full sense, head, the word head, has the idea of headship and authority. It means to have the appropriate, there's that word again, appropriate, responsibility to lead and the matching accountability. It is right and appropriate to submit to someone who is our head. 
The head of every man is Christ. He continues to write. The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Therefore, women in the church have two options in their attitude towards their head or towards man. They imitate the kind of attitude that men have towards Christ, showing a rebelliousness that must be won over. Or women can imitate the kind of attitude Christ displayed towards God the Father, loving submission to him as an equal. The very thought of man being the head of the woman is rejected by many in our society today. But we, the church of the living God, are to be the pillar and the foundation of the truth. If we will submit ourselves unto God and resist the devil, he will flee from us. Going back to the book, Healing the Soul of a Woman by Joyce Meyer, she wrote this about her own experience. She says, I am a woman in ministry, the head of an international ministry, and yet I am also a woman who respects her husband's authority. Dave and I love and respect and submit to one another as unto the Lord. I have had a lot to learn because of being abused by a variety of male authority figures on hundreds of occasions, and it didn't come easily. But God has helped me to see his original plan for the respectful, peaceful coexistence of men and women. And I pray I might always model that, model that for those I have the privilege of teaching. When we go after God and after our healing and we take a stand against the lies that keep us in our brokenness, the need to be connected to one another within the body of Christ is great. That's why our pastor is talking about beyond Sunday. To live this out, to have the courage to live this out, male and female, we need each other. We need to be encouraged by each other. We need to have someone that we can go to and talk about the hurt and and the pain that is in the way that is keeping us from having the appropriate attitudes and mindsets towards male or female. We need to be able to share those things in a safe place. We need to be able to talk through them. We need to be able to confess our faults one to another and pray for one another so that we may be healed. The writer of Hebrews admonishes us in Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It takes courage to be like God in true righteousness and holiness because the more we become like him, the more countercultural we will become. Even so, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen? Amen. So one, th- one last thing that I would like to say in closing is that the importance of not only encouraging one another as we are made new in the attitude of our minds and as we submit ourselves unto the Lord and ask for him to heal us of our futile thinking. But we also need to speak encouragement to our brothers. I, um, I heard a minister's wife share one time that um, actually it was the man that was sharing what his wife did for him. And she, one day, he was having a, a really difficult day. And she went over to him and she put her hands on his shoulders and she said, I find 
no fault with you. I find no fault with you. Does that mean he's perfect? Of course not. Does that mean he wasn't doing things that maybe even had disappointed her, hurt her, maybe worried her, concerned her? I'm sure not. But what does God say of us? In Ephesians chapter 1, he says that he determined before the creation of the world that we would be holy and blameless blameless in his sight. If I am blameless in the sight of my Father, who am I to criticize, put down, find fault with my husband or with any other male or female for that matter? Can we say to one another, and especially to our men on this Father's Day, you are more than enough. You are more than enough because Christ is in you, and you are more than enough. And I find no fault with you because I know that any fault that you have has been put on Christ. The same way that any fault that I have has been put on Christ. Can we do that? So I'm going to just close in prayer. Father God, today we speak over our brothers in Christ in a world that is attacking them in unprecedented fashion. First of all, Father, we repent. (laughs) We repent for any way, whether we be male or whether we be female, that our attitude towards one another has been one of dishonor, has been one that is inappropriate, has been one that is devaluing of the other. We repent of that attitude today. And we ask you, Father God, to cleanse us from this iniquity. Father, we thank you that your word says, if we will confess our sin to you, that you will forgive us our sin and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us, Father God, from what has become so normal to us that it's become invisible, as I heard this week at camp meeting. Our attitudes can become so normalized that they become invisible. And we need you, Father, to wake us up and to help us see what we need to repent of. And then, Father, we bless. We bless the fathers in this house. We bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We bless the men of this house. And we say to them, we find no fault in you. You are more than enough because you are are in Christ. Heal us, Lord, and we will be healed. Cleanse us, Lord, and we will be clean. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today. The Lord bless you. Enjoy your time with your family.